chapter number 3. All right, 2 Corinthians 3 tonight. ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. were blinded, for until this day remain the same This part you don't necessarily need to see. This was from some notes that I had uh, when we first did this. 
to contend not only with and with the evils of paganism, but we had to face also the active malice of jealous who professed to be Christians. The accusations brought by his opponents were numerous. They charged him with walking according to the flesh. You'll notice some of these things that these people, and, and just imagine, you know, Paul has his critics, and this is what the critics say about Paul. I mean, this godly man, this giant of God, and you think, what, what is wrong with that man? But he had critics, and this is what he said. Uh, this is what they said, that he walked according to the flesh. They said that he was a coward, for he wrote letters that resounded like thunder, but in actual presence he was about as authoritative as a mouse. He did not maintain himself in dignity by taking support from the churches, but demeaned himself by working. They claimed that he was not one of the original apostles, and so therefore was not qualified to teach, and that he had no credentials that he could show. That's what we're looking at here. We're talking again about the accreditation of the ministry, and what did we look at here? In verse number, uh, chapter 3 and verse number 1, Paul is talking about this whole issue of credentials. Some of his critics had these letters of recommendation from other churches, and they were able to work their way into churches, and apparently some of them were asking Paul, well, hey, where's your letter of recommendation? And so the, the critics said that, that he didn't have any credentials that he could show. They attacked his personal character by saying that he was fleshly, boastful, deceitful, and they insinuated that he embezzled the funds that were entrusted to him. The accusers themselves were apparently Jews who were ministers of Christ and who were, by means of the clever use of recommendations from other churches, had obtained entrance into the Pauline churches. This is what we're looking at right here. Doubtless they were responsible for some of the schism at Corinth. They were haughty and domineering, but they were not ready to do the pioneering work or suffer for Christ. They were, in short, false brethren. I thought that's pretty good because, again, it gives the context of what we're reading here and looking at this portion of Scripture. Paul is saying this, do, do I need a letter of recommendation in order to be credible before you? And then he goes on and he says this, I don't need a letter of recommendation because I have a letter, all right, and let me tell you what that letter is. Look at verse number two. He says, you are our epistle. You are are our letter. So he kind of flips this on his head a little bit. He says, my critics are saying that I need a letter of recommendation either from you or to you. And, and I want you to know this, church, what he's saying here is that you are our epistle written on our hearts, known and read of all men. I wrote in my, one of my notes here, the proof of the effectiveness of any ministry is whether or not it has the recommendation from God. See, the problem here that, this, this, uh, that, that Paul was coming under is, is that they wanted, the, these, these believers, in particular those of his critics, wanted to know that, um, or, or, or challenge ra rather the proof of the effectiveness of his ministry. And this, this gets into uh, some, some interesting territory when we talk about what does it mean to be a success in ministry. The proof lies, what he's saying here, the proof lies in the epistles or the letters that are written on fleshly tables of the heart. So we can see here that Paul, if we were to judge his ministry by those who, who were changed by his ministry, those who received the Lord Jesus Christ and began walking with the Lord. And you think about his first, his second, his third missionary journey, and you think about all of the all of the lives that Paul impacted. You think about the churches that were, were started by him. You think about how he uh, over and over and over uh, talked about the Lord Jesus Christ and how to be saved. And these were the people who were impacted by Paul, who, who were saved, and as the, the Bible says here, are now epistles, uh, living epistles that are walking around as a result of the, minist uh, the ministry of Paul. Notice what he says here in verse number 3. He says this, For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, you are a letter of Christ, he says, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in the fleshly tables of the heart. So again, the proof lies in the epistles that were written in the fleshly tables of the heart. It's the people 
I mean, how can we say that Paul's ministry, was Paul's ministry credible? Did it, what kind of accreditation did he have? And the proof lies in the, in the pudding, so to speak. You can look at the other people that Paul impacted as far as his life and, and being led of the Holy Spirit and how people were changed and became living epistles of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the question comes up, what about those who were criticizing Paul? What about those who were bad-mouthing Paul? Again, we're talking about the proof of the effectiveness of ministry. And, and again, the, the proof of the effectiveness of ministry is whether or not it has the recommendation of God, but it also lies in the epistles that are written on the fleshly tables of the heart. But what about those who are bad-mouthing Paul, his critics? Are they an indicator that he was not successful or that he was somehow ineffective? Now, I want you to think about that. Did, did, did Paul lack for critics? He did not. Not by any means. He got ran out of several different towns. You think about the trials and the troubles that, that, that Paul had. You can read through those in the book of Acts and, and, and through, the other, um, through the other epistles that are written about the trouble that he had and, and, uh, and, and, and toiling for Christ. And so he was not without his critics. But let me ask you this. Do, does a person's critics... Do they define, did they define his ministry as far as being a success or not? I mean, just the, the, the practical answer is no, that, that that didn't happen. That this man, Paul, at least wasn't judged as far as the effectiveness of his ministry. It wasn't judged based upon, based upon those who were his critics. I wrote this down, though a pastor or a man like Paul can pour everything he has into his ministry... It also takes a willing heart on the part of others uh, to let God have his way. And we see here these people who, who were very critical of Paul, read, read some of the, the criticism that they gave him, and he was still having problems with them. And, of course, this doesn't have a bearing necessarily on his, on his ministry. I want you to notice here, just kind of briefly, briefly, if you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, the end there, verses 14 through 17, Paul talks about triumphing uh, in his ministry. And he goes on and, and he says that, that not only are... Uh, let's read verse 14. He says, Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge in every... Uh, by us in every place. He goes on to say this. He says the, 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 the knowledge of Christ, the, we are the savor of Christ in them that believe because they've been saved and also in them that perish because we preach the gospel unto them and the ministry is still working. In other words, his success wasn't measured by necessarily the crowd that follow him followed him. The, the, the success that he had wasn't necessarily even uh, the amount of people that were saved under his ministry. The success that Paul had was that he was able to propagate the gospel wherever he went. And, and, and I think about that for you and I as far as what does success look like for us as far as ministry is concerned. I want you to think about those who, who again, we have this idea of success that maybe if our church is filled up, then, then woohoo, we're successful. We have a lot of people here, or we have a lot of people saved, and, and all of that is good, but is that really what constitutes success in the Bible? Think about the prophet Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. And he preached unto his people over and over. Did his people listen? Read through Jeremiah, read through Lamentations. The people did not listen. In fact, I believe it was Jeremiah that God said, you're going to preach and they're not going to listen. Can you imagine that? Being in that situation. You meet God, you want me to go and talk to those people and you want me to prophesy to them and they're not going to listen to me at all? Yeah, that's right. But I want you to go anyway. This is exactly what a man like Jeremiah did. The same thing with Jesus. Think about, think about how we would classify Jesus as far as him being a success, particularly toward the end of his life. I mean, what happened to him? What happened to all of his followers? They abandoned him. They left him. I mean, he, he, he died and he suffered alone. And an outside critic could look and say, well, yeah, Jesus' life really wasn't a success. Look how, he, look, how he, uh, look how he died. Look how it ended. And he didn't have any followers 
at all. So having followers or having a crowd doesn't define success. Really, when I think of this and, and what Paul is saying here, as far as success is concerned, you can tell that Paul was credible in his ministry. Uh, number one, because he propagated the gospel to everywhere he went, to everyone he went, everywhere he went, and we see that in chapter number two, verses fourteen through seventeen. He was the saver, uh, he was a sweet saver of Christ unto those that were saved, but also unto them that perish. And why was he that way to both? Because he gave the gospel to both. And it really does depend on other people if they're going to respond or not. And I think that's the thing that I'm really trying to, to get across, at least as far as uh, this idea that a, that a man like Paul or a pastor or anybody for that matter can pour everything they have into ministry. They can give it everything they've got. But it also takes a willing heart on the other side of that, the other person that you're dealing with. It, it takes a willing part on others to let God have his way. I wrote this down. Don't overemphasize. Um, we, th we think about this as far as the, uh, the Apostle Paul here in, in ministering to, to not only the people who uh, who relished his ministry, who were appreciative of his ministry. And we see that in verse 2, that, that those people, they were a written living epistle as the result of the, of the ministration of, of, of Paul uh, by Christ in this instant. But, instance. But you also had this other, this other group, this other crowd, who Paul still rebukes. He still gives them some attention. He still tries to minister unto them, but I think it's important to see here that, that he didn't overemphasize the uh, overemphasize this other group. In other words, you know there's a term, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Usually the one who's squealing the most, or usually where, wherever the problems are at, that's where you give the most attention to. And I think Paul was balanced here in that he not only was addressing the squeaky wheel, which happened to be these critics here, but he was also giving attention to those that, that uh, were growing in Christ, that he wasn't neglectful of them by any means. So moving on here, I want us to, I want us to see some things. Uh, this, this is where it gets fun for me as far as these, these next portions of Scripture. Notice what it says again in verse number 3. He says, For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the, the epistle of Christ, the letter of Christ, ministered by us, Written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in flesh, fleshly tables of the heart. You are, you are indeed a living epistle. Let me ask you this. Let's get, get some feedback here. What is your favorite epistle, your favorite, uh, your favorite letter as far as, let's say, the Pauline le uh, letters? What is your favorite epistle in the New Testament? We'll open that up. I got a couple of Ephesians. All right. Why, why is Ephesians your favorite letter? We'll start with you, Keith, and then Joan. Amen. Ms. Bodie, what do you think? Okay. Okay. Amen. Encouraging, great promises. What else? Okay, give me one more. Someone else. Give me what what is your favorite epistle? Let's see if we can get one besides Ephesians. Colossians? All right, brother, why why is Colossians one of your favorites? Amen. Amen. That's good. Now we could go through and we could probably hit on all of the epistles there in the New Testament as far as why they're important, why they stand out, what they mean to us. But here's the takeaway that I want, want you to get here. You yourself are a living epistle. You yourself are a letter of, of Christ. And who, think about that. These epistles were letters to other people, right? And if you are a living epistle, who are you a living epistle to? Who are you a living letter to? And it's to other people, whether it's lost people or whether it's saved people. And if we can carry that logic in, in particular, what makes these epistles so, so great and so encouraging and uplifting and challenging and edifying and all of these things, what makes them so great? Now, I want you to think about this. 
That should be you. You think about what it means to read you know, Ephesians or, or Colossians or, or Galatians. I like reading Galatians. I think that's one of my favorites. Or even Romans. Uh, just reading some, some of these books and how you're encouraged, you're uplifted, you're edified through the Word of God. And we are to be that living epistle to who? To others. So that when people read our lives, so to speak, they're encouraged, they're uplifted, they're edified, they're challenged. Does that make sense? We are those living epistles. This is what Paul is saying. He's saying, look, do I need a letter of recommendation from you, church? He says, no, I don't need a letter of recommendation because you are the living epistle that we've poured ourselves into and you are the ones who are going to go out and make a difference as people read your lives and they will see by your changed life that our ministry was credible. This is what Paul is saying here in this portion of Scripture. He says this, notice again verse 3, For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, notice he says, ministered by us. Now, how, how, was, uh, he, how, how were, was, uh, was Paul as far as ministering unto them? And he says, you are manifestly or, or evidently declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us. And I wrote down this, this idea of being ministered by us. How did Paul do this? How did he minister unto others that caused them to be a living epistle? Their lives were changed and it was evident for all to see. How did he do that? Did he do that by extra rules? Did he do that by developing a new culture uh, within, within their lives? Did he do that by giving them new standards? He didn't use any of those things. I want you to think about that. He didn't give them extra rules. He didn't give them a brand new culture. And he didn't give them brand new standards. Now, I like to think about this. It was many, many years ago. I remember preaching for a fellow over in Sheridan. I forget his name. Chelsea, you probably remember this. He had a little storefront church uh, over there in Sheridan. And ah, this is many, many years ago. And um, I think this, I, I don't remember. I think this is when when, uh, when Brother Bodie was, was still here. But in any event, I, I went over there. And, and filled in for that brother, that preacher over there in that little storefront church. In fact, it was over there two weekends, and then it was uh, the second weekend they actually, or it was after that second weekend that that was their last service. They closed down the church. This brother was actually down south. He was a southern preacher, and um, and I don't remember what the what the hangup was, but he decided that he wasn't going to be coming back to Sheridan. But the one thing that I remember about, about that man and, and really many others, and I've, and I've talked to some of you others uh, about this as well, it's interesting how that, that some of these missionaries to the West, in particular the, these southern preachers, they like to come out West and they like to replicate the culture that they came from. You ever notice that? And there's nothing wrong with, with southern culture, those southern churches or the things that they do. But this isn't what Paul was about. This isn't Paul, as far as the, the ministry, his ministration or the way he ministered to others, it wasn't to give somebody else another culture. In other words, it isn't the culture of the South and the Bible Belt that changes people's lives. Does that make sense? It's the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that saves lives. You think about this. Culture varies from, from country to country, from region to region. I, I, I always like looking at some of those pictures of some of those African churches. Because, you know, here, you think about the, the as far as our culture, the, the building that we're in. Of course, we got, it's nice and enclosed, and, and we've, we've got lights and running water. We all have nice clothes and everything like that. But if you go over to, to, to say, some African church maybe in the Congo, you've got this, you know, kind of this stick-built-looking hut thing, and, and these people are wearing clothes that, I mean, that really only Africans wear. I mean, is that a credible church? Absolutely it is. Does it look different? Does it feel probably different? Is the culture different? Absolutely it is. So as far as Paul ministering unto them, how did he minister to them? Did he minister by extra rules, culture, or new standards? That's not at all. In fact, notice what he says next. He goes and says, says this in verse number 4. Um, going on again, and he says, "...and such trust have we through, uh, through Christ to God word." Not as though we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. In other words, what, what Paul is, is saying is this. He's saying, that verse 4, he says, And such trust have we through Christ to Godward, 
we could say it another way, it would be like saying this. This is the confidence we have in Christ before God. And what is the confidence that we have in Christ before God the Father? And this is the confidence, he says in verse 4. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything, uh, to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is, uh, is of God. Paul is saying this. Did we, did we change your life? He's saying, did we impart some secret of life that made everything better for you? He says, um, uh, and, and this, is, this is exactly what he's, he's, he's trying to combat. He's trying to dispel that. That it wasn't some kind of secret of life that, that he gave to them that made everything better. It's just as if Paul is saying this, I don't have the power to change someone's life, to get them back on the right track, to cause them to make better choices, to seek after God. Um, if I have the power to do anything, I have the power to screw things up. I have the power to mess up somebody's life. Um, and this is, this is what Paul, Paul is saying here. Where is our sufficiency? Where is, where is the confidence that we have in Christ uh, before God? It's that we aren't sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, our sufficiency is of God. Everything that we have, all of our ability, all of our talents, all of the, the, the ways that we can minister to others, we can't take credit for that. It all comes from God. God gets the glory in all of that. This is what Paul is saying here. And, and again, if we have the power to do anything, it's really to mess things up. I have power to cause people to misplace their trust. You know that? Think about that. If I'm not careful, I have the power to get somebody to misplace their trust in something other than Christ. Now, let me give you an example about this. We do this oftentimes with standards. You know me, I'm not opposed to standards, uh, not by any means. And I think as we become more and more like Christ, and, um, and as we walk in holiness with Him, that our lives will change and we'll develop standards. But let's say I saw someone that was, that was let me pick on Jesse here for just a second. Let's, let's say Jesse uh, is, is kind of a, a brand new believer, whatever it is. And, um, and, and I, I care about Jesse, let's say, sincerely, and I want to see him, I want to see him grow in the Lord, or I want to I see him uh, develop in Christ. But, but let's, say, let's say that I tell Jesse, you know, Jesse, if you really want to get right with God, you need to start wearing you know, a, a shirt and tie to church, and, uh, and you need not cuss anymore, and you need to make sure that you pray at least three times a day, and that will be acceptable to God. Now, we do that kind of stuff, folks. We give people a prescription for a change in standards versus directing them to the Lord Jesus Christ to change their heart. You see, if God can change a person's heart and change them from the inside out, he can change everything. So why Paul is saying, look, were we sufficient of ourselves to do anything and to change anybody? No, we weren't, he says. Our sufficiency is of God. And notice what he says here next in verse number 6. He says, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament. Who is the one who gave them the ability to minister? Well, it was none other than God. Now, I, uh, I went ahead and I drafted something here. You can, you can look at this, and we'll, we'll follow along here. We'll get to as many of the scriptures as we possibly can. But, but here he goes on and he talks about being, uh, he says, not only are we able ministers of the New Testament, but he goes on and he says, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit gives life. So what Paul is saying here is this. We don't have any sufficiency of ourselves. And by the way, it was God. He is the one who made us an able minister of the New Testament. And he goes on to say what this means. It's the, uh, of the New Testament, not of the letter, for the letter killeth, but of the Spirit. It's the Spirit that gives life. So what I did here is I divided this in half. And I have up top here the Old Testament as far as being a minister of the Old Testament. And in parentheses, you see there, letter equals law. And if we look through this portion of Scripture, that's what it means. When he says in verse number 6, not of the letter, he's talking about the Old Testament law. So he says, God has made us to be a minister, but not of the Old Testament law. And so we see that there on one side. And then on the other side, we see the New Testament. OT is Old Testament, NT, New Testament. 
and then we have spirit, and then we have equals the Lord. And we'll get to some of that here in just a moment. But I want you to see in verse, uh, verse number 6 again, he goes on and he says, He's made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit gives life. I had a conversation, actually I've had an ongoing conversation with some some Catholic people that I know, trying to witness to them. And these people are really, 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 um, really indoctrinated with, uh, with their, their Catholic beliefs. And, and it really hinges on this idea that I have to keep certain laws, I have to do certain things in order to be righteous with God. And this is what sums up the Old Testament or the letter or the law. It all means the same thing. What, what, is the, what was the emphasis on the Old Testament or the emphasis on the letter of the law? It's the keeping of commandments, that you have to keep all of these different commandments, and if you don't, then you are not righteous, versus the emphasis in the New Testament, which is what? It's the giving of grace. Now, hopefully some of these will be more clarified as we move along. Notice what it says next in that verse. He says that we're a minister of the, of the New Testament, not of the letter. We're not a minister of the Old Testament or a minister of the commandments. We didn't come to tell you to do X, Y, and Z and to keep all of these commandments, he says. What we told, uh, we, we came, he says, to, to be a New Test, or to be a, uh, a minister of the New Testament. He says the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Notice he says the Old Testament, the letter, it kills. But the New Testament, it gives life. How in the world does the Old Testament, the letter, kill? Turn with me, if you will, in your Bible. Go over to uh, Romans chapter number 7. You'll see some references up there. I want you to see this. Romans chapter number 7. Paul makes the statement and he says, the letter kills, the letter killeth. If he was, if he was partaking in the, the ministration or being a minister of the Old Testament, it would lead to death is what he's saying here. Well, how does being a minister of the Old Testament lead to death? Notice what it says in Romans chapter 7, uh, starting here in verse number 5. Notice what it says. For when we were in the flesh... The motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring uh, to bring, bring forth fruit unto death. He talks about the motions of sins. We all know what sinning is. And he says that those sins were by the law. What does the law cause us to sin? No, it doesn't cause us to sin. But if there is a standard of righteousness and we fall short of that standard somehow, that's sinning, that's missing the mark. And this is what he's saying here. He's saying that the motions of sins which were by the law did work in our members, did work in our bodies to bring fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit, not the oldness of letter. So this is some of the same language that we heard before in 2 Corinthians. He goes on and he says this. What shall we say then in verse 7? Is the law sin? Is the law sin? I mean, it, we, 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 he says the motions of sin, which is by the law. He goes on, is, is the law sin? Is, is that what, what sinning is? No, he says. He goes on. He says, God forbid, nay, uh, I had not known sin, but by the law. For if I, uh, for I, I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of uh, concupiscence, for without the law sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. In other words, what he's saying here is this. The, it, isn't the sin, it, it isn't the law that is the sin. The problem is, is that when I miss the mark, when I don't fulfill the commandment, that's when I sin. And he goes on and he says this in verse number 10. And the commandment, uh, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. Here you have this good thing, he says. It was meant for good. 
and I am finding that I can't keep it, and it leads to death. It actually hurts me. He goes on and he says, verse 11, For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and just and good. Verse 13, Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by commandment might become exceeding sinful. What he's saying here is this, is that the, the commandment, the Old Testament law, the purpose of that was to reveal our sinfulness. It was to show that we indeed are sinners. How would you know that you're a sinner except you had some way of finding out? And what the, what the Old Testament did, what the letter of the law did, is it reveals who we are on the inside. It wasn't for us to keep and to become righteous. It was to show us that we always fall short. This is the purpose. And therefore, the Old Testament, the letter of the law, it kills, but the New Testament, it gives life. Not only that, but it condemns. Uh, back, in, uh, back in 2 Corinthians 3, we see that, that, it's, it, that it does condemn. Uh, but turn with me, if you will, over to Galatians chapter number 3. In Galatians 3, notice here, he talks again about the purpose of the law. What is the purpose of the law? And really, it condemns us. Galatians chapter 3 and verse number 18, it says this, For if the inheritance be of the law, in other words, if I could earn righteousness and if I could earn heaven by the law, he says, it is no more of a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. If you could earn it, it wouldn't be by promise anymore, it would be by your works. Does that make sense? This is what he's saying here. Verse number 19, Wherefore then serveth the law? What is the purpose of the law is what he's saying here. It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was foreordained of angels in the hand of a mediator. Uh, he goes on and he, and he says here, um, look at verse 21. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid, he says. For if there had been a law which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. I want you to think about that. Think seriously about what he said. He said this. If there was a commandment that you and I could keep that would give us eternal life, then he says the, the uh, righteousness would come by keeping those commandments. God, just tell me which commandment I have to keep and he'll give me life, right? And he says that that's not how it works. He goes on and he says this in verse 22, but the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before, uh, before faith came, this, uh, he says, we were kept under the law, shut up uh, uh, unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, notice verse 24, wherefore, he says, the law is our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. What is the purpose of the law? Well, it reveals who we are and it condemns us. And in that way, it teaches us that we always fall short of God and we need to look to another as far as our righteousness. God, I can't keep it. God, I don't measure up. God, I don't know what I'm supposed to do, but I know that keeping the law isn't going to earn me righteousness with you. All it does is condemn me. All it does is show me that I fall short and that I'm not good enough, God. And that's the point of the law, that it teaches us that through condemnation of, our, of ourselves and of our sin, that it brings us to Christ. He says it's a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. It moves us in the direction of, God, I can't, to Jesus who, who, who can and who will and who saves us. Notice what else the Old Testament, the letter of the law does. Doing, we could say it this way, as far as the, the letter of the law, doing or acting or behaving a certain way equals righteousness. How are you supposed to be righteous with God? Well, you're supposed to keep the commandments. And, and this is the, the problem that the Jews had. Turn with me, if you will, over to Romans chapter number 3. Notice what it says, uh, or excuse me, I've 
You can keep your finger in Romans 3. We'll look at that here in a second. Romans 10, though, is what I wanted first. Romans chapter 10, verses 3 through 4. Notice what he says here. This is talking about the Jews. This is after Christ had came. And he says this in verse number 3. He says, For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. God, how am I supposed to be righteous with you? You gave me the commandments, so I'm going to go out and I'm going to establish my own righteousness by being a good person and keeping your commandments and doing all the things that you told me to do, and I'll be righteous that way, right? This is what the Jews thought, and this is what Paul rebukes them for. He says, they were ignorant of God's righteousness. They went about to establish their own righteousness by keeping the law, and they have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Verse 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Where does your righteousness come from? If you're a sinner, and you are, and that your sin condemns you because of the commandment, and it does then how are you as a condemned person supposed to get, be righteous? Where is your righteousness supposed to come from? And this is the beauty of it. It comes not from yourself or what you can do. It comes through Jesus. In verse 4, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. Romans uh, uh, it goes on and it says that. Where is that at? Romans 10, uh, what is it? 10, 10. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So the Old Testament, the letter of the law, had this emphasis that you had to do things in order to be righteous. The problem was, or the problem is, is that we can never do enough because we always fall short. Whereas faith in the New Testament is what equals righteousness. If you're there over in Romans chapter 3, look at verses 21 and 22. Notice what it says here next. He says, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested or made known, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by, uh, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. In other words, where do you get your righteousness? You get it through faith. This is what it's saying here in the New Testament. Uh, notice, notice here, go back with me over to 2 Corinthians. I do want to finish this here. I, I like this next little bit, the, the imagery that he puts here. Notice what it says in verse number 7. He says, but if the ministration, um, but if the ministration of death, written and engraven on stones, was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the, the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather, uh, be rather glorious? Uh, for if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. What he's doing is he's hearkening back, and we're not going to go there, but you can, you can, the reference is up there. In Exodus chapter 34, you have the scene. You remember Moses, he brought down the Ten Commandments, and then he destroyed them because the people were, were rebelling against God. They created the golden calf. Well, Moses goes back up the mountain, and he's up in the mountain for 40 days again, 40 days and 40 nights. And God, God tells Moses, I want you to go ahead and carve out a new a couple of tablets, and we're going to write the commandments on them all over again. And Moses is there in the mount for 40 days and 40 nights. The Bible says he doesn't eat or he doesn't drink during that entire time, which is pretty interesting because, you know, Moses didn't need to eat or drink. He was just having a jolly good time up there with God. You know, I'm, I'm fellowshipping, fellowshipping with God. And he didn't have a care in the world, and he didn't need to eat or drink. Reminds me of that verse. I, it might be in Colossians, but God upholds all things by the word of his power, and he can uphold ourselves. If you were around him, you wouldn't need to eat or drink too. But during that time, uh, the Bible says he came down off the mountain, and they saw a pretty miraculous sight. You can just imagine Aaron or Joshua, you know, they're, they're looking up the mountain, and all of a sudden, and they're looking, and they see this bright light. Hey, you see that? Yeah, that, that, that's Moses. Is he carrying a lantern or something? You know, what, what, what is he doing? And it turns out that his face was glowing because he had been spending that time with God 
and he'd been given the Old Testament law, which the Bible says was glorious. And as a result of that, he came down off the mount, and his face was glowing. I mean, it looked like he'd been, you know, in a nuclear plant or something like that, playing with uranium. I mean, it was just like a light bulb. It was just radiating off of his face. And the Bible goes on, and it says that, that he actually put a veil on his face to cover up the glory. Now, why is this important? It's important because Paul is, is he's, he's showing an illustration, and he's saying this. He's saying the ministration of the law was glorious. It was wonderful. And that's evident by Moses when he was up on the mountain, when he came down. You can just imagine, he had one tablet in one arm and one tablet in the other. You know, he's just walking around and his faith, face is glowing. You know, hey, how's it going, fellas, you know? And, 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 and it was just glorious. And he says this, if, and that was the ministry, uh, ministration of death. The law brought death. And he says, if that was glorious, then how much more glorious is the ministration of righteousness? This is what he's saying. Verse 9 says, For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration, uh, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. In other words, what Paul is saying is this. The only reason that the Ten Commandments was glorious is because the ministration of righteousness that was going to come afterward was even more glorious. You can kind of put it, think of it this way. You know, we've got the glory of the sun and the glory of the moon. Where does the glory of the moon get its glory from? It gets it from the sun. The sun reflects upon the moon and we see the glory of it. And this is what he's saying. It's like the... the the, the law, the ministration of death, is like the glory of the moon. And the only reason that it has any kind of glory is because the glory of the sun, which is the glory of righteousness. This is what he's saying. Verse number 11, For, that, um, for if, if that which was done away was glorious, and notice here he says this, this is at the bottom here, the Old Testament was done away. If that which is done away is glorious, much more that which remaineth is is, uh, is, is glorious. So he's saying, look, as far as the New Testament versus the Old Testament and being a minister, we're a minister of the New Testament. And I think that's, that's really what you need to see here. This is what he's saying. We're ministers of this and not the other. We're ministers of the New Testament, the giving of grace, the giving of life, bringing others to Christ, showing that faith uh, by, by faith is, is righteousness. Or righteousness, rather, comes by faith. The ministration of life, which is more glorious, it's absolutely superb. And it's the, it's the thing that remains. The Old Testament has gone away. And I want to wrap up with this last bit here. He says this, Seeing that we have such hope, we use such, great, uh, such plainness of speech. What he's saying is this, it, it, it's, it's really boldness. Seeing that we have such hope in this new ministration, He's saying, we have boldness in our speech. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end uh, of that which is abolished. And what he's saying here is this. He's making a contrast, and he's saying this. Moses put a veil over his face so that the Israelites wouldn't see the end of what was passing away. You see, that glow of his was fading, and he's saying that Moses put a, ve a veil over his face so they wouldn't see the fading glow that was, that was on his face. And he's, again, he's, he's drawing a connection, he's drawing a dot, and he's saying just as the uh, glow of Moses was going away, it's like the Old Testament itself. The glory is fading away. And he says this, though, in verse number 14, but their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. What he's saying is this. When Moses had that veil over, over his face, revealing or, uh, uh, hiding the glory that was fading on his face, the Jews didn't know it. They didn't realize that the, that the glory was fading away. And this is what he's saying here. He says, their minds were blinded, and it's, they're blinded until this day because this veil here, he speaks, 
he speaks uh, in, in, um, in figurative terms. This veil is untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament. He says this, every time they read the Old Testament, every time they read the law, they're putting a veil over their face and they're not seeing the true glory of the Lord. This is what he goes on and he says. Notice what it says, verse 15. But even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, or when they shall turn to the Lord, notice it says, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. I don't have time to get into all this, but you see this also in Romans chapter number 11 as well. How, why are the Jews blinded? The Jews are blinded because of a veil. And what is the veil? The veil is none other than the Ten Commandments. And because they keep relying upon the Old Testament, they keep relying upon the law, it's blinding them. It's a veil upon their heart. How is that veil ever supposed to be taken away? It will be taken away if they do what? They turn to the Lord. They have to turn to the Lord, and then will that veil be taken away. And you can just imagine, when, they, when that veil is taken away, and they see the glory of the Spirit of the Lord, this is what he's saying here. He's saying the, the, he's saying the Lord is that Spirit. We're talking about the ministration of the Spirit here, is what, he was, uh, what we were, were looking at there. The New Testament, the Spirit in the, in the Lord. He says, the, uh, the, now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And he says, we're looking uh, with open face in a glass. And it's, it's, what he's saying is this, we're peering into the law of liberty. We're peering into the Lord himself, and we are changed in the same image. Just as Moses, how, how the glory that he had was because of the time he spent with God, the more and more that we peer into the perfect law of liberty, we become more and more like it, and we, we reflect that glory in and of ourselves. Does that make sense? I hope it does, and I'm way over time, so we're going to have to pray here and be done. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you for the Word of God. Lord, thank you for for teaching these things. God, I, I, I got excited when, when reading this and studying this, and I don't know if I did a great job at getting it across. God, I pray that you'd help your people to see these things and help us to see, help us to look into the perfect law of liberty that we might be changed into the same glory that we're peering into. God, help us not to have a veil over our own hearts thinking that we can earn righteousness by any other way than by faith. God, thank you now for this evening. We pray that you bless the rest of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. We're dismissed.